All right, please be seated. Thank you for everybody's promptness. And we're ready to continue with the testimony. And Ms. Kappelman, the state may call its next witness. The state calls Brock Dietz. Brock Dietz, please. Good afternoon. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in. If you could please raise your right hand, respond to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. Sir, please introduce yourself and spell your name. Good afternoon. My name is Brock Dietz, first name B-R-O-C-K. Last name Dietz, D-I-E-T-Z. <laughs> How are you employed, sir? I'm currently a law enforcement detective um, with the state of Florida's Bureau of Fire, Arson, and Investigations. How long have you been doing that? 28 years. All right. What about in 2014? What were your duties there? Um, I, I was still an arson investigations, but I also have other duties, which include forensic video analysis. What training and education do you have in the area of forensic video analysis? Okay. I've been performing um, forensic video analysis since 2002. For the past 20 years, I've analyzed over 830 different video and audio submissions. Um, the training that I've had has occurred from not only public agencies such as the FBI and Virginia State Police, but it also comes from private institutions and also forensic organizations. I've been to 15 different classes as either a student or a lecturer involving video analysis. And um, again, I've done over 830 different submissions. All right, and were you asked to analyze or clarify some videos in reference to the state of Florida versus Catherine McDaniel? Yes, I was. All right, and does that include bus video? Excuse me? Bus video. Correct. ATM video or ATM stills? Correct, the stills. Still images. And uh, Premier Jim surveillance video. That is correct. All right, I want to start with Premier Jim. Um, Judge, at this time, I would ask to enter and introduce into evidence states 117. That is the raw data from Premier Jim pursuant to stipulation. All right, for the record, any objection? No, no Your Honor, no objection. All right, so 117, the Premier raw data will be admitted as states 117. Thank you, Judge. So you were provided with all the images from the Premier Gym around the time in question, right? That is correct. And they had a bunch of different cameras mounted at the, at the time at that facility? Correct. Exterior cameras and interior cameras. All right. And did you create for, well, just tell the jury what you created out of the raw data that you were provided in States 117. Okay. When I was presented the evidence with the video, um, I was asked by the state, and at that time they had identified um, the victims vehicle, the victim himself, and the suspect's vehicle. Um, and I was asked by the state to highlight those images or when those vehicles and, and the victim and the suspect's vehicle, when they came into frame of view, to highlight them so that um, it would be easier for the judge and jury to be able to take a look at it. All right. And judge, at this time, I would ask to introduce the clips provided by the witness as State's Exhibit 89. <laughs> Any objection from the defense? No, Your Honor. Be admitted as State's Exhibit 89. And permission to publish that exhibit? Yes. Actually, strike that. We're going to publish it, just not right now. Let's move on. All right, I want to talk about the ATM video. What did you do in reference to the raw data that was provided to you in reference to the ATM images in this case? Um, simply made still images from them. I'm going to approach and show you states 37 through 43.
is of what you retrieved off the ATM raw data. Yes, ma'am. All right, and where was the ATM located? I'm not familiar with it. It was just provided by yes, law enforcement. Okay. Judge, at this time I'd ask you to evidence 37 through 43. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Be admitted as states exhibits 37 through 43. All right, and then I also wanted to show you. I wanted to show you states four. All right, let me ask you first before I show you states four. Were you provided with some raw data from the uh, Star Metro bus company here in Tallahassee. Yes, I was. And did you analyze that data looking for to isolate some images in particular? Correct. Um, I was able to isolate um, victim's vehicle as well as the suspect vehicle. All right. And that was from cameras mounted on the outside of city buses? Yes, that's correct. Judge, at this time I would ask to introduce pursuant to stipulation states 118, which is a thumb drive containing the raw bus surveillance data. All right, any objection? Uh, no objection. Be admitted pursuant to stipulation states exhibit 118. All right, and then at this time, Judge, I'd also like to introduce states 90, which is the exhibit prepared by this witness containing the clips of the bus data. Any objection? No objection. Be admitted as States Exhibit 90. Right, now I'm going to show you States 4. <coughs> I'm just ask you if you recognize that as one of the images that came off of the raw bus data that we were just talking about. I do. That's fair and accurate? It is. Any objection? No objection. States Exhibit 4 is admitted into evidence. And no further questions at this time. Cross examination? <coughs> Excuse me. No cross, Your Honor. All right. Can we excuse the witness? He may be excused, Judge. All right. All right. Thank you, sir. You are excused. Have a good day. State may call its next witness. State calls Craig Isom. Craig Isom, please. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Before you have a seat, we're going to swear you in. Please raise your right hand and respond to the clerk. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you shall give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Please have a seat. Good afternoon. Please introduce yourself and spell your name. Craig Isom, C-R-A-I-G-I-S-O-M. How are you employed, Mr. Isom? I'm currently retired. What are you retired from? Tallahassee Police Department. How long did you work for TPD? 28 and a half years. What were your duties at TPD? I had numerous uh, over the time period. The last 10, I was in criminal investigation. As part of your duties in criminal investigations, did you investigate homicides? Yes. Were you assigned to investigate the homicide of Dan Markell? I was. Were you the lead investigator in that case? Yes, I was. Were you assisted by any other 
Um, law enforcement agencies. Yes. What what other agencies? Uh, specifically, the Federal Bureau of Investigation. All right. Did you personally respond to the crime scene in this case? Yes. And is that crime scene located in Leon County? Yes. All right. And when you arrived at the scene, had the victim already been transported to the hospital? Yes, he had. <clears throat> Was there any evidence that you observed on the crime scene that this was a robbery or a break-in? No. Any evidence that anything had been stolen or removed from the property or the vehicle? No. So where do you start an investigation like this? Well, you um, try to find out as much background as you can on the victim and what his activities and actions were leading up to the crime. All right, let's talk about what evidence there was on the scene. Was, do, you, do you know if the victim was dressed in gym clothes? Yes. Okay, and had a gym bag or a gym towel in the car? There was items of that nature in the car. All right. Um, we've heard testimony that he had a cell phone in his hand. Do we have any evidence that he was on the phone at the time? Yes, there was a, a reporting person who actually was conversing with Mr. Markell uh, at the time that the incident occurred. All right, and that was that the person whose business card was located inside the vehicle? I believe so. All right, and was a neighborhood canvas done to see if anybody in the neighborhood saw anything? Yes, there was. All right, and were you able to develop a witness, the neighbor, Mr. Geiger, who we already heard from? Yes. All right, anybody else see anything in the neighborhood? No. All right, and when you were working on establishing a timeline of the victim's activities, we talked about him being in gym clothes. Was there any evidence collected to suggest he actually had gone to the gym that day? We found that he had been at Premier uh, Fitness Club on uh, McClay Boulevard, and we obtained video surveillance from that establishment, that business, um, that showed him there. All right. Did, did you find any evidence to suggest where he went prior to the gym that day? Uh, yes, we, we were able to de determine that he had dropped off his two young boys at daycare on West Tharp Street, and the time was 8.50 a.m. approximately. All right. And then what time? Did he go straight from the daycare to the gym? Yes. What time did he arrive at the gym? It was 9.12. All right. I'm going to show you what's been introduced into evidence as States Exhibit 89, the gym surveillance. Could we publish that now, please? What can you tell us about the camera angles that were available or the surveillance images that were available from Premier Gym? There was numerous on the outside. There's a couple on the inside where you see his image entering and exiting the gym. Uh, you can see where the car, his car, pulls into the parking lot and parks. Do you know how long the victim was inside the gym? It was more than an hour. All right. So are there six to seven different camera angles that show the victim or the vehicles that we're interested in? Yes. All right. And are you familiar with the exhibit where they were compiled for ease of presentation? Yes. All right. So let's take a look at this exhibit. All right, what is this vehicle in the blue circle? That is Mr. Markell's Honda four-door black. And is he entering the gym parking lot in this image? Yes, he's entering off of uh, Village Square Boulevard. Once again, that's him coming down north to south from Village Square Boulevard in the parking lot. And is that him pulling into that parking spot behind the flag? It is. All right, does he exit his vehicle immediately? No, it takes a couple minutes. This, this is uh, what's being determined as a suspect vehicle. 
And does the suspect vehicle turn into the parking lot behind Mr. Markell? Not directly. The suspect vehicle goes all the way up Village Square Boulevard to McClay and then comes in the main entrance of right. Premier. So is that the suspect vehicle driving past the Correct. victim? Correct. And that's Markell exiting his car. And is the time on this correct, 9, 12 a.m.? Yes. Is this Markel in the red shirt entering the gym? Correct. Here's Mr. Markel entering the front doors. And what does the suspect vehicle do while Mr. Markell's in the gym for approximately an hour, a little better than an hour? The uh, suspect, the driver of the suspect vehicle moves to different locations within the parking area, off to one end, and then moves again, and then ends up behind trees. But as far as you can tell, stays in the parking area? Oh, yeah. Yes. Excuse me, so Markel's already entered and now the car is driving past by again. Do you know the make and model of this vehicle? It's a 2008 Toyota Prius in color silver pine mica. Is this another area of the gym parking? Correct, this is at the south end as, as it denotes south parking. What's happening now? Uh, Mr. Markell is now exiting the building of Premier. And at what time does he exit? 1039. Oh, I'm sorry, it says 1033, I guess it was. Okay, he's not outside in the parking lot, but it says 1033 and that is accurate. So are we going to see Mr. Markell pull out of the parking lot here? Yes. And the suspect vehicle follow behind? Correct.
Markel's car heading back the way it came in. The circle is indicating where the suspect vehicle is coming from in the back. Were you able to get a tag number off the vehicle from the surveillance we just watched? No. All right. Were you able to review or find some other surveillance images of this vehicle? Yes. All right. Let's talk about the bus. Are there cameras mounted on our city buses here in Th Tallahassee? There are. All right. And did those buses capture some of the route from where these two vehicles went after they left Premier Jim that morning? Yes, a good deal of it. All right. Where did... Mr. Mark had when he left the gym that morning? Uh, he went out to uh, Village Square Boulevard to Thomasville Road and then south down on Thomasville Road towards his uh, neighborhood in Benton Hills. Right. And let's start with uh, States Exhibit 90, which has been previously introduced into evidence. If you could tell us about Bus 505, what does that show us? Bus 505 is pulling up here. The bus is, the, the bus is uh, traveling east on McClay Commerce Drive. Um, it comes up to this intersection, and that is what appears to be Markel's Black Honda southbound on Thomasville. So he's left Premier, gone to Thomasville Road, and now he's southbound. All right. Hit play, please. That's what appears to be the same Prius, green Prius, that was in the premier parking lot. It's following in the direction of Mark Hill went. This same bus turned off of McClay Commerce Drive, went southbound, and caught up to a similar Prius here at the intersection of Metropolitan Boulevard. And were you able to get the tag from the Prius off of these images? No, unfortunately not. Is the route we're seeing the Prius take in this portion of the exhibit consistent with heading toward the Markel residence? Yes. Does this bus catch up with the Prius again before he turns off toward the Markel residence? Yes, uh, right there where the circle yeah. is, that appears to be the same Prius in the left-hand turn lane for Benton Road. All right, we feel positive at the end of this clip. Once again, the Prius is making the left-hand turn onto Benton Road. All right, and at what time does the Prius make that left-hand turn? I don't have the exact time. Um, does 10.51 sound right? Yes. Okay, and do you have an idea of when Mr. Markell was murdered? It was before 11 a.m. Okay. All right, and then was there additional surveillance video from a city bus that captured this Prius after the murder? Yes. All right, and was that bus 707? It was. Okay, if we could publish. We might have a little 505 to finish watching here. Okay, here we go, 707. All right, this is seven, 
707, it's northbound, it stopped on, it's on Thomasville, it's northbound, it stopped at the light at Armistead Road. And this is the suspect vehicle passing by. All right, could you rewind it and watch that clip one more time? Were you able to learn some more information about the suspect vehicle based on this? These, These images, images provided us um, with a couple of characteristics, a few characteristics about the car. One of them, as you can see, the passenger mirror casing. The outside mirror casing is black. All the Priuses come with the same body color on the mirror casing. This one obviously has been replaced of some at some point. So you got a black uh, passenger side mirror casing. There's a what appears to be a sun pass or some type of sticker up in the top center window and it's common for tolls. And then I don't think you can see it from here, but um, if you back up just a hair, there'll be a kind of grainy on this image. Maybe your all's is better, but there's a, a black hole just below the driver's side headlight. And I think you have a pointer up there to assist oh. you. Okay, I'm not sure. Although no one's had much luck with the pointer, so you, you're being well, good, you you'll be a good guy. <laughs> Sorry. If you just look below the driver's headlight where the bumper is, there's a black hole. And that, that's correct. That is where a tow hook would mount if the car needed to be pulled or towed. And it's missing. The cover, the plastic insert that covers that hole is missing on this car. All right, let's let it play through. Looks like something, can you back it up just a hair? I'm sorry to keep doing that to you. Okay, stop right there. Something white on the windshield there. Do yeah, that's that what I was is? referring to is, is a possibly a sun pass uh, adhesive toll reader, uh, transponder for when you drive through tolls, so you don't have to stop. Is that a South Florida thing, or do we have those here? Central and South Florida, predominantly down in that area. Very, very rare up here. What can you tell us, if anything, about the passengers based on this video? The passenger is animated, and it appears there's some type of white clothing or a towel, something that's moving around on the, on the passenger side. Um, and then there's nothing you can't really tell on the driver's side. It looks like it's black as far as any type of clothing or... Let it play one more time, please. Let it play too. I'm sorry. Watch the whole thing. There you have the three characteristics that I was referring to. Is 
just the same bus? Yes, it's just another angle. It's the camera's mounted up on the front part of the bus. Prius is passing in the left-hand lane. And the 707 bus video occurs at approximately 10.55 a.m.? Yeah, I have 10.55 uh, where it's at the um, stoplight. So then the murder, that puts our time of the murder between 10.51 and 10.55, is that right? Correct, okay. yes. And do you know what time the 911 call came in from Mr. Geiger? 11.02. All right, let's talk about the sun pass. You mentioned you thought the suspect vehicle appeared to have a sun pass. Uh, what, if any, investigative efforts were done to try to locate that particular sun pass? Well, there was a lot of um, painstaking effort to figure out if this car um, had gone through tolls and which tolls uh, the closest Sun Pass or toll system is north of Orlando, uh, down in Wildwood, Florida, where I-75 intersects with the Florida Turnpike. That was checked exhaustively um, without luck, and we we didn't really have anything else to go on. It's just Prius. <laughs> Come to find out, there's thousands of Priuses and and a lot of Sun Passes attached to them. So. Um, that wasn't working out too good, but eventually we did locate uh, uh, the location where a car like this utilized the Sun Pass through tolls down in South Florida on I-75, but that was in correlation with the cell phones that we eventually got. All right, so after you got cell phone records for suspects, you were able to kind of go back to the Sun Pass records and narrow down the time frames. Correct. That okay. helped us in determining their route, the travel route they took. And then we were able to determine there's a toll on each end of Alligator Alley down in Spring, South Florida. And um, the toll transponder activity was consistent with where these cell phones went. And do you know the times exactly that this thing went through those tolls? The the one for uh, leaving Miami, leaving Miami and getting on I-75 eastbound or westbound to go across the state towards Naples was at 2.18 p.m. on July 16th. So that's two days before it's the murder. And what about going home after the murder? Going home was the date of the murder, same date, that evening at 5.23 p.m. That transponder activated at the Alligator Alley Toll Plaza going eastbound from approximately Naples towards Fort Lauderdale. And is the time frame of the Prius passing through this toll booth on the way home consistent with them leaving Tallahassee as we just saw in the bus video and going straight south to that toll plaza. Yes. All right. And how many Prius, once you narrow down the time frames based on phone records, how many Priuses with SunPass pass through those transponders at both the times when we know their phone records were coming and going? Only one. All right, were you able to, once you identified this particular SunPass transponder, does it have like a, a unique identification number attached to it? Yes. Were you able to track that particular transponder to a business? Yes. Tell us about that. I subpoenaed uh, records um, through the Department of Transportation, State Department of Transportation, and they returned information that showed this particular car. Obviously, I'm only looking for anything during those time ranges. And they provided this particular car, and it was one of 
numerous sun pass transponder adhesive type that go to a business in, in uh, Miami, North Miami, uh, called Save Gas Hybrid rent car All right, is that located at 11032 Biscayne Boulevard? Correct. All right, and was this particular Prius ever located? It was. Tell us about that. Well, it, by the time we got to it, it had been sold. It actually had been sold twice, but we were able to track it down and find the current owner. It had been painted. It was actually painted white. Um, new, new Sun Pass, obviously, because the old Sun Pass went with the previous owner. But everything um, was determined to be uh, accurate as at the time that this incident happened. The tag number, the transponder number, and so forth matched what the records were from Save Gas. This business. And did Save Gas have records that indicated this Sun Pass was affixed to a Prius and that Prius had a particular VIN number? Right. That's correct. All right. And when you found the particular Prius, were you able to confirm, even though it had a new owner and new Sun Pass, that it had that same VIN number that was attached to the Sun Pass in question? Right. The vehicle identification number that's unique to each individual car was the same. All right, when you went to the save gas, were you able to get any documents associated with who rented this Prius at the time of our murder? Yes. I'm going to show you what I've marked as States Exhibit 67. And Judge, at this time, I would ask to move into evidence States Exhibit 67, the rental agreement from save gas and the GPS information with a certification of authenticity. Any objection? No. no objection. All right, States Exhibit 67 will be admitted. Guys, I think we're there. We're there. Make a call tomorrow. Luis Rivera. Mm -hmm. I'm showing you now 48 through 52. Are those all fair and accurate yes. photos of the Prius? Yes. As you observed it when you located the actual car. Right. Years later after having been sold twice. Correct. Judge, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence for the Any objection? No objection. Be admitted as 48 to 52. So I would ask to move into evidence state 
All right. So that will be admitted uh, as State's Exhibit 72 without objection. Correct. Yes. Yes. That's correct. Well, the phone numbers were consistent with what we had already. Uh, obviously, there's an additional phone number um, up there. It says brother. That was determined to be one of the co-defendants. Sigfredo Garcia. And this phone number, was that discovered to be the real phone number for Rivera? It was. And what about this address, Norman? That was his. That was his current address at the time. And what about he had another address too, didn't he? With Jessica Rodriguez. Yes. What address is that? Your Honor, if we could just get for the record what it is that that Mr. Ison was taking a look at. Um, okay, are you reviewing your report? I'm looking, looking to make sure I have the address right. Okay. And uh, what? just a, sh a sheet that has addresses on it. Completely understand if you oh, can put All right. Yes. Fifteen zero five Northeast One Thirty Fifth Street, North Miami, Florida. Okay. All right. And back to this rental agreement. When was this vehicle rented? On the fifteenth of July. And when was it due back? It's due back on the seventeenth of July. Two days later. Obviously not time. Nope. Correct. 
Mr. Eisenhower, are you referring to that exhibit? Is that what you're looking at there? Okay, this is what I'm, this is what I'm looking at for the evidence. Okay, what I want you to do is, if you either, I want you to look at the exhibit if you need to respond with the exhibit, if you need to refer to your notes, if you can just tell counsel that you need to refer to okay. that, and then she'll ask you to refresh your recollection. Okay? Yes. Thank you. And I can bring it over here if you can't see the exhibit from there. It should be on your screen as well. Oh, I, we took that screen no, out. No. <laughs> I can carry it over here. I'm going blind here. <laughs> All right, let's talk about phone numbers. We talked about that phone number that was listed on the rental agreement for Luis Rivera. Did you subpoena call detail records for that phone number? Yes. All right, and would you be the person responsible for analyzing the call detail records or is that done by someone else? It's done by the technical operations unit. All right, and would that be Sergeant Corbett? Sergeant Chris Corbett. Okay. But you did the subpoena and received the returns for these phone numbers? Yes. Okay. So specifically in reference to the uh, 305-570-8153 for Rivera, that is... One moment, I'm sorry, Your Honor. Yeah. I'll come back to that. I think it's going to be exhibits 91 through 98 that we're hunting. All right, so the phone number that was listed on the rental car agreement for brother, 786-372-5986, you mentioned that that phone number was associated with Sigfredo Garcia. Was that phone number subpoenaed for the call detail records? It was. All right. And did you receive a return for those as well? Yes. All right. Did you also subpoena social media content that contains that phone number? Yes. And under what Facebook name is that num does that number appear? Well, the Facebook uh, identifier is... Tuto Dade. Yes, this is part of the return that was showing that uh, this image was on Tuto Dave's Facebook page. All right, and the phone number associated with brother is associated with this Facebook. That's correct. And the Facebook image, is that someone that you recognize? Yes. Who is that? This is Sigfredo Garcia. Any objection? No. Exhibits 60 and 61 will be admitted. You may. Yes. And who's the mother of these children? Catherine
All right, I want to show you State's Demonstrative Exhibit C. Could we publish that, Ms. Dugan? Have you had a chance to review this exhibit before today? I have, yes. Okay, and could you explain to us, starting with Luis Rivera and Sigrid Garcia, those are the two in the Prius, correct? Yes. All right, and how they're related or connected to the other players on this image. That's pretty terrible. I wonder if we could, could we try displaying it from the laptop maybe? You can go ahead and start explaining it while she's working on that. I don't want the jury to have to wait. Can, can they see it? No. no. Okay. You have to just tell uh, us. <laughs> uh, Luis Rivera and his friend Sigfredo Garcia were the two individuals operating in the Prius. Sigfredo Garcia is the mother of his children, is a defendant. Catherine Meg Banwa. There's two children by them. It was determined Catherine had a relationship also with Charlie Adelson. Charlie Adelson is Dan Markell's, was Dan Markell's brother in law, Wendy Adelson's brother. Charlie Adelson's parents are. Donna Adelson. Thank you. She'd be to the second from the left top. And the father is Harvey Adelson. Top left corner. So you have Harvey across the top from left to right. Harvey, Donna, Charlie, Wendy, Dan Markell's ex wife. And then on the far right is Dan Markell. Correct. And did you have some ATM images in this case? Yes. Tell us about the ATM images. Where did they come from? We uh, found out that there was a bank transaction at uh, an ATM drive through in Broward County, I believe it was Broward County, where they were on their way home and they stopped and Rivera, who was operating the car, he withdrew money at an ATM. And we were able to get images of both of them in the car. Still in the green room. Correct. Consistent with being on the way home from Tallahassee. Yes. After the yes. That is Luis Rivera. That's Luis on the driver's side and the far image or far person on the passenger side is Sigfredo Garcia. Once again, Rivera is operating the car. He's in black. We're back to the bus video. Uh, Garcia is in white. He's on the passenger side. Yes. All right. Was you mentioned that the Prius was the only lead that you got from the crime scene? 
Was there a lead that started with um, Dan Markell's personal life? Yes. Uh, Dan and Wendy Marquette, well, Dan Markell and Wendy Adelson had gone through a very lengthy and contentious divorce starting in 2012. And as part of your investigation, did you review the divorce file in their case? Yes. Was the divorce file pretty voluminous? Very, very over, large. Over 700 pages? I, I don't, yeah, it was a lot. Let me show you what I marked as State's Exhibit 59. Just flip there and tell me if you recognize it. Yes, <laughs> it's a lot. Does that appear to be a fair and accurate copy of the Markel's divorce file? Yes. And you reviewed that as part of your investigation? Yes. I want to ask you about a couple documents in there specifically. Do you know when their divorce was finalized? Objection. And what's your objection? Motion to eliminate, Your Honor. All right. Uh, your previous objection is noted, but uh, are you asking that for the file to be admitted at this time, Ms. Kaplan? No, sir. Okay. So uh, I'm going to allow him to refer to it. And um, so your motion, it's denied for my previous uh, reasons stated on the record. When was their divorce final, is the question. July, it was uh, July 30, 31st of 20, 2013. All right, so a year before the murder in this Correct. case. Was the finalizing of the divorce the end of the litigation between Dan Markell and his former wife, Wendy? Not at all. All right, were there numerous filings that occurred between the time their divorce was finalized and the time of Mr. Markell's murder? Yes. Even including uh, as recently as March 26th of 2014, shortly before his murder? Correct. Could you tell us about that March 26th, 2014 filing that Dr. Markell made? Yeah, Mr. Markell um, was, had found out that uh, his children, his two young children um, had been spending time with Markel's mother-in-law, uh, Donna Adelson. And from the children, they said that, they said disparaging things, that, the, that Donna Adelson had told them or said in their presence about Dan Markel. And these were things like, Grandma says you're stupid, Grandma hates you, and um, that was, that was kind of the, the last straw, the way it looks, on, when you read through this stuff. Was that, that, um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. That Markel had um, decided that he wanted to have, that his mother-in-law should have uh, supervised contact with the children. Sometimes Only supervised supervision. contact. Only supervised. Only contact. yes, yes. He did not want the the mother-in-law to have unsupervised contact with the children. All so right. That was, the was that motion ever heard by the court? No. Why not? Because Dan Markell was murdered. All right, Judge. At this time, I would ask to move into evidence the divorce filing exhibit, which is marked as State's Exhibit 59. All right, subject to uh, the uh, previous objection noted on the record, anything else that you need to add? One moment, Your Honor. No, Your Honor. All right, uh, it will be admitted as State's Exhibit 59. All right, and Mr. Isom, in those documents, just to sort of give them <coughs> an idea of what we're talking about, they were, this couple was arguing over things as small as a tennis racket. Correct. And, and quite large things that were very valuable as well, right? Yes. Okay. 
And are you familiar with a motion that's included in that exhibit where Wendy Adelson was seeking to relocate to South Florida with her children? Yes. And what was the outcome of that motion? It was denied with prejudice. All right, so she was not legally permitted to move from Tallahassee to South Florida. Correct. All right. Who was in South Florida? Why did she want to move there? Her parents. Harvey. Where did they live? At the time, they lived in Coral Springs, Broward County, Florida. And are you familiar with some emails between Wendy and Donna Adelson in this case? Yes. I'm going to show you what I marked as How did you come into possession of those emails? I'm sure they were obtained uh, through the voluntary submission of Wendy Adelson's computer. And I also believe there was a subpoena for her Google account. Okay, well, we can't find them at the moment. So I'm going to move on and come back to emails. Fair to say that the emails were unfriendly to Dan Markell. Very much so. And did the emails, what kinds of things did the emails include? Before the uh, ruling that she could not, that Wendy could not relocate to South Florida with the two boys, there was a lot of suggestions by her mother, Donna Adelson, um, to compel or, or insist that relocation was very important and they needed the stability of the boys in South Florida um, because they were divorced now and now we're talking about two different single parents. After the denial, because um, I believe in, in June of 2013, um, Donna, according to the email, she ramped up uh, her suggestions to Wendy and wanted to attempt to coerce Markel to allow the relocation by bribery, um, by uh, suggesting that the children would be moved from uh, a Hebrew Jewish religion to Catholicism and possibly even baptized in a Catholic church. Knowing full well that Dan Markell uh, was very devout in his faith, being Jewish, and that it would get under his skin, and they thought maybe this would trigger something to, for him to voluntarily allow them to take the kids to South Florida. All right, and was another suggestion that they could even bribe Markell into allowing the relocation? Yes. And was a specific amount mentioned? A million dollars. So obviously, this was a lead, right? This nasty divorce and custody battle. Right. Did you interview the ex-wife, Wendy Adelson? I did. When was she interviewed? Uh, within hours after the Dan Markell was shot in his garage. Where was Ms. Adelson located? She was at a restaurant in Killarn in the Killarney area north of I-10 off of uh, Market Street. All right, and did she, during her interview with you, suggest who might have wanted her husband dead? Well, she said that somebody may have, somebody could have done it as if it was to help her. Who? She's, does she say who? She just said that some somebody that she knows could have possibly done it. But she also made the statement that her her brother Charlie had stated previously that he looked into hiring a hitman and found it was 
cheaper to buy a television for as a divorce gift. All right. Her brother, Charlie. Is that Charlie Adelson on this sheet? Correct. Had looked into hiring a hitman? That's correct. To kill Dan Markell? Yes. That was a conversation that he, that she reiterated he told her. Okay. I want to circle back now to the phone evidence. And you mentioned that Sergeant Corbett was responsible for analyzing the phones, but there were several different sets of records that you obtained for his analysis. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so States Exhibit 91 pertains to Luis Rivera, 305-750-8153. And Judge, at this time I'd ask to move into evidence pursuant to Stipulation 91, which does contain a certification of authenticity. Any objection? I didn't hear what it was, but... States Exhibit 91 with the prior stipulation. No objection. Be admitted as States Exhibit 91. 92, the records of Sigfredo Garcia, also containing an affidavit of authenticity. That phone number is 786-372-5986. Any objection? No objection. All right. States Exhibit 92 will be admitted. Just, I'll point out it's 5968. Sorry. Sorry, jury. 5968. States Exhibit 93 relates to the call detail records of Wendy Adelson. Phone number 954-803-0079. Also containing an affidavit of authenticity. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Be admitted as States Exhibit 93. Next, Judge. States Exhibit 94, the call detail records of Donna Adelson. Phone number 954-396-0997. Also with an affidavit of authenticity. Any objection? No, Your Honor. Be admitted as States 94. States 95, the call detail records of Charlie Adelson. Phone number 954-254-9223. Also with a record certification. No objection. Thank you. Be admitted as States 95. States 96, the cell phone records of Harvey Adelson. Phone number 954-980-9032. Also with an affidavit of authenticity. Any objection? No, Your Honor. States Exhibit 96, admitted. The cell phone records of Catherine McBanawa. Phone number 786-564-1321. Also with an affidavit of authenticity. 1312, no objection. All right. Be admitted without objection, States 97. Did I say that one wrong as well? You said 1321. Dyslexic today. Not normally. Okay. States Exhibit 98, the call detail records of Dan Markell. 202-276-8200. And that one has an affidavit of authenticity included as well. No objection. Be admitted as States 98. All right. So, Mr. Isom, you received all of these records from the phone companies and turned them over to Sergeant Corbett for analysis? Yes. Okay. I want to ask you about another aspect of your investigation, your meetings and interviews with Louis Rivera. I want to start with a meeting or an interview that occurred on September 30th of 2016. Were you present for that? Yes. Okay. And in that interview, did Mr. Rivera include the name Catherine McBanawa as someone that was involved in this murder? Yes. Was there ever a time where 
you or any other law enforcement or person of authority in your presence said Rivera has to say the name Catherine McDaniel to get a deal? No. All right. Did you make some efforts to check out some of the things that Mr. Rivera told you that were stuff you hadn't heard before, didn't already know pursuant to your investigation? Yes. All right. I want to ask you specifically about the the hole in the Prius. Can you tell us, summarize what Mr. Rivera told you about the hole in the Prius? Objection, Your Honor. Hearsay as to what Mr. Rivera is saying. That's that's sustained. Okay. Did you have reason after Mr. Rivera's testimony to think there might be a hole in the Prius? Yes. <laughs> did, you, did you go to look at the Prius? Okay, this was before or after you had already found the actual vehicle. Hold on one second. Do you have an objection? Objection, Your Honor. This line of questioning is premised now on hearsay. Okay, overruled. You may proceed. Was this, when you went to look for the hole in the Prius, was it before or after you had already found the actual Prius? The first time we had already found the Prius, did not even know about a hole in the floorboard of the Prius until Rivera provided that information. All right. So you go back to find the Prius again and look to see if there's a hole in the floorboard. Correct. And was there a hole in the floorboard? There was. All right. I'm going to show you some additional. This is a straight rod that has been positioned from the inside down through the outside, showing the trajectory of the hole. Same thing, closer, and you're starting to see what is going to be the gas line of the car. Yes. It was. All right. There was an additional proffer on October 4th of 2016. Were you present for that meeting as well? I was. All right. Did you as a result of your meetings with Mr. Rivera, attempt to locate the murder weapon in this case? We did. What did you do to attempt to locate the murder weapon? I queried him to extensively, and then we actually took him on a road trip, for lack of a better term, in, in the van, and then later on in a car to attempt to locate the body of water that they were close to when he stated that Garcia, they stopped off of I-75 and Garcia got out and uh, threw the gun towards the water. All right, and you did not recover any firearms as a result of those efforts, did no. you? No. Okay, how many bodies of water on the side of an interstate are there between here and Miami? Numerous. Okay. Um, I want to ask you about the arrest of Catherine McDaniel. On what day was she arrested? October 1, 2016. Were you present for her arrest? I was. And was that in Miami? It was in Davie, Broward County. All right. And when she was arrested, was there anything unusual about the law enforcement presence there? Was there more or less law enforcement than there typically would be for a murder arrest? It would be, it was the status of what you would go for a murder suspect. You want to make sure that, there's, that they're not going to get away. Okay, but was it heavier or lighter or typical? It was just typical. Okay. All right, and on this date, when you were in the process of making this arrest, did you get a phone call? I did. 
All right. Was that subsequent to Ms. Magbanoa being permitted to make a phone call? Hold yes. on one second. Do you have an objection? objection? Sidebar, Your Honor. All right. We'll have a brief sidebar. You may continue. All right. So during the arrest of Ms. Magbanoa, is she permitted to make a phone call? Yes. And at the conclusion of that phone call, do you receive a phone call? Yes. How much time passed between her phone call and the one that you received? Less than 20 minutes. Right. And who was calling you? An attorney named David Marcus. And who did David Marcus represent? He indicated he represented Charlie Adelson. I want to ask you about Ms. McVanawa's employment status around the time of this murder. Did, was she, did you get some evidence that she was receiving checks from the Adelson Institute? After the homicide, yes. All right, and what is the Adelson Institute? It's a periodontal office in Broward County. Um, does dental work. And who owns the Adelson Institute? Harvey and Charlie Adelson. All right, and did Donna have some connection to that business as well? Yes. What was that? I think she did a lot of the clerical stuff there. She wrote the checks that were received by Catherine McBanwell. 
She signed one. Okay. Did you make any effort to determine what, if anything, Ms. Magvana was doing to earn the money from the ALC Institute? Yes. Okay. What did you do to try to determine that? We subpoenaed their office. I went to the office myself, and Special Agent Sanford went to their office and provided a subpoena to two employees that happened to be there at the time, seeking employment records and documentation showing her duties and so forth at the office. All right. And did you interact with employees when you went into the business? Yes. I know what kind of a business it is, but is it a large enterprise? Like, how many employees do you have? There was only two there, and from my understanding, it was maybe two others that worked there, I believe was what the records show. All right. And were the employees there able to enlighten you as to what it was Ms. Magvana did there? No. One had never heard of her, and another said she'd heard the name. Objection, Your Honor. Move to strike here, sir. That's sustained. That's here, sir. That will be struck. Were you up on a wire, a T3 wire, when you went into the Adelson Institute? Yes. And as part of that wire, were you listening to Charlie Adelson's phone calls? Yes. And during the time that you were physically present in the Adelson Institute with your subpoena, was a phone call made to Charlie Adelson? Yes. Was Charlie Adelson physically present at the Adelson Institute when you went in? No. Was it regular business hours when you went into the business? Yes. All right. So one of the employees there made a phone call that was recorded? From another location outside my presence. Okay. And ultimately, you left your subpoena there, is that right? Yes. And left the business not knowing what her employment was at that time? Correct. Okay. And were you provided with any documentation from the Adelson Institute? No. All right. Did you receive a copy of the checks that Ms. Magbanawa received from the Adelson Institute? Yes. I know we had a list of checks. Okay. When you left your subpoena there, you got back a copy of those checks, right? Or a list of those checks? Yes. Okay. Did you ever get anything like an application? No. A job description? No. Any W-4? No. Schedule? No. Personnel file? No. Okay. So I'm going to show you what I've marked as state 68. Do you recognize 68? Yes. Is that what you got from the Adelson Institute? Is that what? Is that what you received from the Adelson Institute? Yes. And that was in response to your subpoena for all documentation regarding the employment of Captain Magbanawa? Yes. And what's contained in the exhibit? It's just that she was given these paychecks on an incremental approximately every two weeks. There was a paycheck or a check written from the Adelson Institute to Captain Magbanawa. And when did the payment begin? When did these checks begin? In September. September of what? 2014. So approximately two months after the murder? Yes. And how long did they continue? All the way through March of 2016. Until there were arrests in this case? Yes. Pretty close to that. All right. Were you able to get any evidence through the course of your investigation that Ms. Magbanawa was physically going to the Adelson Institute to perform some job? There was no indication of that. Okay. Was there a poll camera on the defendant during your investigation? Yes. What's that? A poll camera is utilized for surveillance in an open public setting. So it would be attached to a utility pole. In this case, it was attached to a utility pole in the neighborhood where Captain Magbanawa and Sanfredo Garcia resided at the time. And it's a continuous feed. It's just 
images. It's not. It's video. It's not audio, and uh, it it is up for a long duration of time. All right. So, was she observed coming and going, maybe on the weekends, consistent with going to the business to clean when the business was not open? Objection, Objection. Your Honor. Evidence speaks for itself. If it's in evidence. All right. Overruled. You can answer. She did not go um, to anything that was consistent with that. All right. Didn't seem to go to the Adelson Institute on the weekends. No. Nope. Evenings. No. Nope. Uh, what about any evidence of contact with patients, like by phone or some other means? We were monitoring her phone as well as Charlie's and Charlie Adelson's, and there was no contact with patients through that through that resource. What was the time frame that you were monitoring the phone calls of Ms. McBanawa? Um, it started in April of April, I believe, 7th or 8th of 2016, um, all the way through past uh, the arrest of, of uh, Sufredo Garcia. And you didn't capture any calls to, to patients on there? No. Do you know whether Wendy Adelson was able to relocate with her children after her husband was murdered? Yes. She was? Yes. Where did she move? She moved to what ended up being Miami Beach. I, don't, I believe, well, the memorial service for Dan was two days after he was shot it was on a Friday. Memorial service was on Sunday. Her and her parents were on the road to South Florida on Monday, the 20th. One moment. Okay, there's some confusion about Sigfredo Garcia's phone number that I want to try to clear up. Could you, is there anything in your uh, records that you could refresh your recollection and tell us what his phone number was at the time of this murder? Sigfredo Garcia's phone number at the time was 786-372-5986. I created that. Okay, we're going to take our afternoon break now, and um, so uh, we'll break for about 10 minutes or so, uh, give you a chance to stretch your legs, uh, use the facilities, then we'll come back and start with the cross-examination, okay? Please no talking about the case, and the deputy will escort you out.
All right, Ms. Kappelman, anything from the state before we bring the jury in? No, Your Honor. Okay, from the defense? No, Your Honor. Okay, let's bring the jury in, please. All right, please be seated. And we're ready to continue with the testimony of cross-examination. Mr. DeCoste. Investigator, how are you doing? Okay. So, I think you and I can agree on some stuff. And Your Honor, if I could approach. You may. You know what those are, right? Yes. Those are still photographs of the characters involved in this case? Yes. And you know it because it's from the, the state's demonstrative? Yes. And because you were the, the investigator on the case for years and you know the faces? Yes. And those photos fairly and accurately depict those people? Correct. And for the record, those are three markers of demonstrative. Okay. Investigator, this is a, it's a confusing case with a lot of characters, right? Correct. And I want to make sure that we have it right on who's who. Dan Markell. He was murdered, correct? Yes. Before he was murdered, he was married to Wendy Adelson. Yes. And Wendy Adelson's father is Harvey Adelson. Yes. Her mother is Donna Adelson. Yes. And Wendy has a brother, Charles Adelson. Yes. Now, at one point in time, Charles dated Catherine McVann, right? Yes. And Catherine, in high school, met this guy, Sigfredo Garcia. I don't know when they met, but they have two children together. And based on the ages that you know of Mr. Garcia and Ms. McVann, well, she had those children when she was young, in her early 20s. I haven't done the math. But we agree, and we're talking about what we agree on here. We agree that he is the father of two of her children. On birth records, that's correct. All right. Now, Sigfredo Garcia, not a Latin king, right? No. But this guy is. Yes. That's Luis Rivera, right? Yes. That's a childhood friend of Sigfredo Garcia. Yes. He was a Latin king boss, not just a member, but the boss in Miami. Right? Yes. We agree on this. Yes. And we agree that these two guys, Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera, were the hitmen in this case that murdered Dan Markell. Professor Markell, correct? Yes. We agree on all that. Yes. Let's talk about the motive in this case. We agree that the motive in this case was over a divorce, right? Divorce was an element of relocation with the children, and Wendy Adelson was the bigger motive. So Dan Markell, Professor Markell, and Wendy Adelson were going through a divorce. Yes. And it got bad. 
Oh, yeah. And you and I agree that that was the motive for them to have Professor Markell murdered, right? I believe that they ran out of any other option and they chose this. So we agree on that, that the motive was because of the divorce and the child custody battle in this case. The Adelson's motive. Correct. Yes. But in your investigation, there was an issue. How these two Miami guys connected to the Adelson family, right? Right. We agree on that. Right. And you worked hard to try to figure out what connection could there be between these people. Right? Yes. And ultimately, you came upon Catherine McBanla. And you believe that the connection between these two guys from Miami and the Adelson family was through Catherine, correct? Yes. Now, if during your investigation, now, correct me if I'm wrong, shortly after Ms. McBanla was arrested, before other arrests have been made in this case, you retire. She was the last arrest before I retired, yes. And there's been arrest since you retired? There has been an arrest, yes. In work and investigation since you retired? Yes. Okay. Had there been information that showed that these two guys, specifically Sigfredo Garcia, tied directly to this guy, Charles Adelson, there could have been a different outcome while you were the investigator, correct? Objection calls for speculation. If you, he can answer the question, overrule. Can you repeat it, please? If you had found information tying Sigredo Garcia to Charles Adelson, completely separate from Catherine McBanwell, that would have led to a different outcome in your investigation. Correct? Not necessarily, because the, the, the same stuff would have come up eventually concerning Ms. McBanwell. I want to focus on what we agree on here. So perhaps we agree on this. The government's demonstrative, demonstrative city. We agree that's government's demonstrative, right? Yes. And this is the government's <clears throat> focused theory of the case. That the Adelson family, through Catherine Magdalena, hired Sigredo Garcia and was her victim. We agree on that, but that's a government's theory, correct? Yes. And you're aware of what ours is. So their theory is that it was through Catherine Magdalena, right? We agree on that. Yes. I'm showing you now what's been pre marked as demonstrative. You would agree with me that that is our theory, the defense's theory, that the Adelson family hired Sigredo Garcia and Luis Rivera without going through Catherine Magdalena. Would we agree on that, right? I don't agree on this demonstrative as far as the case. Is that what you're asking me? I'm not sure what you're asking me. So let's back up because I want to make sure that we're yeah. clear on this. Showing you again government's the I government's see. arguing this, right? Yes. That it was through Catherine, right? Yes. And we're arguing this, right? Okay. That it wasn't through Catherine. Right? That's what you're you're saying. I mean, I'm not sure what you're asking me. I'm asking you if you're aware of the argument that we're having that it was about Catherine Magbanois and not through no, her. No, I'm not aware of that. All right. Let's go back to before you retired and let's focus now on general duties of law enforcement. Do you believe that they've changed since you retired? No. Would you agree that, that the, the, the job of law enforcement is to objectively investigate a case? Yes. To then present the evidence, whether it's good or bad? Yes. Now, when you're investigating cases, you compile reports, right? Yes. You record your activities. Yes. You provide that to the prosecution? Yes. And then we end up getting all that in what's called discovery, right? Correct. That applies to anybody who's charged in a case, whether it's Luis Rivera, Sigfredo Garcia, right? Yes. Now, another important aspect of those reports and recording and uh, taking down everything is for when you're testifying like today, right? Yes. Because you need to, those reports are in front of you, right? Some of them, yes. And that refreshes your memory and helps you remember what was said, what was done, stuff like that. Correct. Let's go back now to May of 2016. Two guys on the bottom, Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera, they're arrested in May of 2016, right? 
Yes. You would agree with me that the, we can go back to agreeing on stuff. You would agree with me that the evidence against those two guys, Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia, was strong. Absolutely. We went over, or you went over in our direct examination with Ms. Kaplan, there's evidence that they were here and that they were in that Prius. Yes. That they murdered Professor Markell. Yes. But of course you were lacking the connection to the Adelson family. Right? I'm not sure what the question was on that. We're in May of 2016. Correct. At that point in time, you're lacking a connection to the Adelson family. You got these two guys. You got them dead to right. But what you don't have is any connection to Charles Adelson and the rest of the, the family. We already knew about Mac Banwell, if that's what you're referring to. We already knew that Mac Banwell was with Garcia and that she'd also been with Charlie. And after researching and finding no connection between Garcia and Charles Adelson, she's it. She's the only connection. So going back now to the question that I asked you at the beginning, had you uncovered at that time evidence tying Charles Adelson to Sigfredo Garcia, that would have taken your investigation in a different direction, right? Objection calls for speculation. That's speculation. I, I, that's sustained. You don't need to answer that. So let's turn to another topic. The day of the shooting, July 18, 2014. You would agree with me that when TPD responds out to a, a crime scene like this, that you want to keep it quiet for multiple reasons, right? Yes. You would agree with me that it's, that it's only fair to family and friends, to loved ones, that they learn from you and not through the media or from other people, right? Correct. It's also important for the integrity of your investigation because you don't want, I mean, if there's anybody that you could then arrest that day in the area, you don't want it out there that what you know, right? Yes. That same day in the afternoon, you go and find Wendy Adelson at Mosaic Restaurant and take her back to TPD for some questioning, right? Yes. And it wasn't until late in the afternoon that you let her know that her soon-to-be ex-husband, Professor Markell, had been murdered. I let her know that within 15 minutes of the interview. You would, he, had, he had been shot, and he most likely would not survive. You would agree with me, though, that that was well after 12.30 in the afternoon. Oh, 12.30, yes. It was after that. Well after that phone call that apparently was made by Sigfredo Garcia to Catherine McBannell. Right? Yes. Let's now focus on Louis Rivera. Louis Pedro, so he's a member of the characters. At the time you arrested Louis Rivera, you would agree he was in a desperate position given the evidence you had against him, right? A desperate position? Let's go over that. You had strong evidence against him, placing him as involved in the murder, right? Yes. He's then charged with first degree murder. Yes. And if you know, looking at the death penalty. Okay, yes. There was also the potential that his non Latin King co defendant, Sigfredo Garcia, could flip on him and cooperate against him, right? Are you asking me my perspective of what was going to happen? I'm talking about what your knowledge of. Mr. Rivera is before you get into a cooperation agreement with him. I knew that, and he knew, that there was a mountain of evidence against him. Would you agree with me that there would be a danger in telling this guy what to say to get a deal? Can we agree on that? A danger? Yes. Danger to whom? A danger to a miscarriage of justice if this guy is told what he needs to say to get a deal. I, I would never consider telling him anything. Okay, so let's, let's get into that. You would agree this is a bad guy? Yeah, he's a bad guy. Gang leader? From my understanding, yes. Has a potential to lie? Yes. Has a motive to save himself? I would say so. And you deny 
deny giving him the script of what to say in this case? I did not give him a script of what to say in this case. He ultimately cooperates in this case and gets a plea agreement, right? Yes. And he gives you a series of statements in between September 29, 2016 through October 4, 2016. That's about right. Now, we talked about discovery in this case, all the reports. And you all authored a bunch of different reports in this case, right? Yes. Before that, there were arrest warrants for Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia, right? Before what? I'm not following. Before? Yeah, that was confusing. Let me back up. So before you author any reports, right, before you author reports about their arrest, you first have to arrest them, right? Right. All right. So I jumped ahead. So you draft and you get arrest warrants for Luis Rivera and Sigfredo Garcia, right? Yes. And if you could explain to the jury what kind of information is contained in an arrest warrant. Has their name, their date of birth, identifiers, social security number, last known address, what the elements of the crime were, what the evidence against that individual is. is. And that's what I want to focus on. The evidence, that, that's a detailed narrative of the case, correct? It is. There is some detail in there, probably not always everything in the warrant. You would agree with me that the arrest warrant for Luis Rivera was dozens of pages of the facts in this case. I don't recall how long it was for that guy. You agree with me, though, that it was multiple pages? I don't recall. Do you have a copy of it? Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. Okay. Let's turn now to your reports, and then we'll come back over to it. So you author two main reports. September 14, 2016, you author a report, right? Do you have it there in front of you? Uh, I, can I refer to this? You can refresh your recollection. Please give me the date again. So top right-hand corner, 9-14-2016 at 15-35. Yes, sir. I have it. Now, for juror reference, this is authored 9-14-2016, correct? Yes. And this is before Luis Rivera starts cooperating. Yes. And in these reports, and I'll refer you to page 4 specifically, it talks about your belief that Catherine McBannon was involved, right? Yes. You also authored another report, and the date is 7-12-2016, top right-hand corner, a 31-page report. Yes. You'd agree with me, that's several months before Luis Rivera starts cooperating. It's... July versus September. So July 12, 2016, you author this report, give it to the state attorney's office, it gets sent over to Luis Rivera in discovery to his attorneys, and then roughly two and a half months later, he's cooperating in this case and giving you information, correct? I don't know the timeline of all that. I don't know when the state received it for sure. I don't know when it was provided in discovery. So let's talk about what you can give me. This is, this is authored and this is finalized on 7-12-2016, right? Actually, it's approved on 7-27, but... So the end of July, this thing is done. Yep. Luis Rivera, the first time that you meet with him to get his statement, his proffer, and we'll talk about the difference in between an interview and a proffer, that is done on September 29, 2016. Actually, I was notified on the 29th. I didn't meet with him until the 30th of September of 2016, for the record. Okay. So there was the potential of a couple of months to review your report. Sure. You would agree with me that this report <coughs> details what your believed theory of the case is. Yes. That it was through Catherine McBannon. I don't know if it's part in that one or the first one you referred to for 9-14 of 2016. Would it help you to, to review your 31-page report? I'm, I'm looking at it. Do you have a specific section or page? And please don't give me a page number. It's probably not going to be the same as my format. You're on a man approach? Okay. Yeah.
Okay. That help? Yes. You agree with me, there's a lot of talk of Captain McBannell in this report. Yes. Now, in order for in order for Mr. Rivera to get a deal, he has to advance your theory, right? I don't know how, I'm not sure how to even answer that. I, I already gave my part in here, um, you're asking me for a lot of questions that is out my, outside my purview, you not being the prosecuting attorney. I understand. You were the lead investigator, right? Yep. All right. And you went and met with Luis Rivera in May of 2016 and when he was arrested, right? We met with him at the federal detention center, Coleman, in Central Florida. And that interview was recorded? Yes. And you would agree with me that you told him, giving us Garcia is not enough. We already have him. Okay. You agree with me that yes. that was said? So you have that meeting in May of 2016 where it's not enough to give up to Credo Garcia because you already have him. There's then arrest warrants and reports that are talking about Wendy Adelson and Catherine Magbanwa, and several months later, he comes back to you and says, Wendy Adelson and Catherine McBanwell were involved, right? In so many words, yes. And it was his words, this guy's word, his word alone, that resulted in the arrest of Catherine McBanwell. Objection, calls for speculation. If you know, you can answer. I, after his proffered interview on September 30th, she was arrested the very next day. And you would agree with me that it was not enough without his testimony? It wasn't enough for the state attorney's office to approve the warrant, correct? So let's talk about what Luis Rivera says. The direct evidence that he gives against Catherine McBanner. First, Luis Rivera says that Sigfredo Garcia told him that Catherine was involved, right? Yes. These reports explain how Garcia was involved, right? How Garcia was involved. Correct. Yes. And his movements and his actions and his phone calls, correct? Yes. In fact, one of the pages in here talks about specifically the volley of communications, not the substance of it, but just when the communications happened between Mr. Garcia and Ms. McBanner, right? Yes. The next thing, the second thing that Luis Rivera gives as evidence is that he overheard some phone calls, right? Yes. You'd agree with me that the discovery discusses the call frequency between Garcia and McBanner. Are you talking about my discovery? Is that what you're asking? Correct, yes. I don't recall when it was brought up or how it was brought up, but as you're referring to this section that you pointed out to me, there's phone calls between Garcia, Magbanwa, and Charlie Adelson, back and forth, but not between, directly between Adelson and Garcia. They all go back through her. We're getting a little bit off track here. So I want to bring it back in. We're talking about what Luis Rivera tells you is the direct evidence against Kathy McBannell. The first one is Sigfredo Garcia telling him that she was involved. The second one that Luis Rivera says that he overheard some phone calls that were being had between Sigfredo Garcia and Kathy McBannell, right? No, he overheard one particular one immediately after the homicide. All right. And you would agree with me that he didn't have to make up that there was a phone call because it was right there in your report that said there's a phone call at 1230 after the murder, right? If he had access to it or if it was read to him or given to him, yeah, he could do that. He would just have to pepper in what the, the conversation was about. Sure. You have no reason to believe that he didn't get your report and discovery, right? I have no idea. I'm, I have no idea. In your many years as an investigator. Once again, I have no idea. That's my answer. 
Okay, but let me ask the question. In your many years of an, as an investigator, you learn that these reports become part of the process and go to the defense. You know that, right? Yes. And you have no reason to believe that that didn't happen here? I have no reason to believe otherwise in this case. All right. Now, the third thing that Louis Rivera says, the third and final piece of direct evidence, all the evidence that he gives against Kathy Magbanwa, is that there was this supposed meeting the day after the murder where the payment was made, right? Yes. You would agree with me that your reports discuss the cell phone proximity of all these people on the morning of July 19th? Yes. So let me back up to make sure that that's clear for the jury here. The murder happens on July 18, 2014. Correct. July 19, 2014, it is believed that there is a meeting between Luis Rivera, Sigfredo Garcia, and Catherine Magbanwa where a payment is made. Yes. And Luis Rivera says, well, Catherine's there and she makes a payment. Yes. Right? Now, there's some cell phone communications that morning, and then there's also the general proximity of cell phones in the Miami area, correct? Correct. And all of that is explained in the report about the communication activity and the proximity of the phones, correct? Yes. So all Luis Rivera would have to do is just pepper in some details to make it into evidence, correct? Well, let's make sure that the jury's clear that the conversation was not captured. It was just where the phones were in the duration of the calls. So as far as the payment or anything, that came directly from Rivera. Correct. So what we're talking about is that Luis Rivera can take it and go, all right, so there's a phone call at 1230. I know there's a phone call, and I know that because they're telling me. Oh, yeah, that was the phone call where I heard there was a murder. He could do that, right? Yes. And again, you agree this is a dangerous guy. I've already answered that, yes. Yes. And although you said that you didn't give him the script intentionally, didn't you unintentionally give him the script of what to say? If you want to look at it from that hindsight, yes. That's all the direct evidence he gives, correct? Uh, Against Ms. Magbanwa. To my recollection. So let's go to one of the pieces of circumstantial evidence that the state asked you about, the paychecks from the Adelson Institute, right? Your theory is, is that it was payment for involvement in the murder, right? I just know she received compensation for no known duties, nothing, nothing that she, she didn't do anything for them. And that's great. Proceeding. That's great for their theory, right? I, I guess so, yeah. I mean getting paid and not having responsibilities. Again, their theory. That's great for their theory to have payment for no actual work, right? Correct. Now, you can't say whether she actually worked there or not because you agree with me that you didn't fully investigate. But I'm not following. So, Charles Adelson, he works at the Adelson Institute, and that's a brick-and-mortar location, right? Yes. But he's a traveling periodontist. Yes. And you've explained to the jury what that is. He goes to other dentist's office to do special work. So he's not working at one location constantly? Correct. Now, you were aware of Catherine McBanwa's job description, right? No. You, did, you weren't aware that she was communicating with patients? No. Do you not remember, or is that a no, she wasn't? Do you not remember, or is that a no, she wasn't? To my knowledge, she was not contacting patients. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at your deposition? Sure. Page 117, lines 4 through 10. Okay. You could read that portion. You understand? No, 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 don't read it out loud. Just read it to yourself, and then when you're okay. done, look up.
Okay. Go ahead. Did your phrase. Did that help your memory? Yes. What was Captain McVanwish's job description at the Adelson Institute? According to what was talked about on the phone was contacting patients, and that would be the wire tap of Charlie and Katie, Captain McVanwish's phone. So surreptitious recordings of Captain McVanwish speaking to Charles Adelson talks about her working at the Adelson Institute. It just reference of contacting patients. And that would, and, and his patients are what? He's only a dentist, right? Yep. He's not a doctor. He doesn't have patients in another field of work, right? No. So his only patients would be through his dental work. Yes. And she was getting paid for doing work for the dental office. That's what was said on the wiretap. That was what was captured. And that's what I was referring to in my depo. So you would agree with me that she's working at the Adelson Institute? No. No, I do not. Would the work of communicating with patients require her to be in any specific office? No. Were you aware whether she did or did not have a work phone? I was never. I never found any evidence of a work phone. I did not know whether she had a work phone. If you could explain to this jury what you did to look for it, I didn't. I didn't come across anything. There was never a reference to any other phone number besides the one she maintained that we had. My question was, what did you do to look for? I didn't have anything to do with it. But you had I this. I didn't look for a phone, a separate phone. That's what you're asking. You had this information from surreptitious recordings, recordings that they don't know about, where she's talking about communicating with patients. So you knew that there was a there was a lead there, right? I don't remember if the if the reference to patients was at the beginning of the wiretap. Or later on, when they, when I felt like they were suspicious of being wired up. Let's talk about what other investigation you did. Did you go and speak to patients, whether, no. they, whether they've spoken to Catherine McBanlow? Once again, no. Did you even try? No. Could have gone to the Adelson Institute, stood out front, and asked people, "Hey, do you know who this person is?" Did not do that. Going back for a second to the wiretaps, the. The wiretaps were over a period of time in April, roughly May of 2016, correct? Yes. And you reviewed those yourself? I reviewed a good portion of them, yes. Now, the, what's been termed is the bump, the communication between law enforcement and Donna Adelson. That doesn't happen until around the 20th, correct? I believe that's correct. And in your review of all of the phone calls prior to that bump, before anybody knew anything was going on, you heard phone calls where it was talking yeah, about. Hear say. It's sustained. Your Honor, if we can go sidebar. All Investigator, I'm going to frame this a, a little bit better for you, just for the jury here. The government asked you the question about whether there was any evidence that she worked for the Adelson Institute on direct, and your answer was no, right? Correct. 
I've now asked you whether you reviewed the wiretap, specifically those prior to the bump, before anybody was thinking, hey, law enforcement is looking at us, right? Okay. All right. In your review of the wiretaps, are you aware of the call on April 15, 2016, at 12.03 and 10 seconds, where Ms. Magbanua says to Charles Adelson, quote, still work for you? Still what? Still work for you. I don't recall that offhand. You would agree with me that a phone call where she says, still work for you, is evidence that she works for him. I don't know what context that was in. I'm not sure what preceded that or what, what was discussed beforehand. That, that terminology could mean a lot of things. Could also mean that she works for the Edelson Institute and is legitimately receiving paychecks, right? Yep. Now, not only did you have the wiretaps and have all this call detail record, at one point you get Charles Adelson's iCloud data, right? Yes. Now, iCloud data, for anybody that doesn't know, that, that's all your information that you have in the cloud with Apple for an iPhone, correct? To my understanding, yes. It includes text messages, phone call logs, notes, calendar events, contacts, stuff like that, right? I, I don't know to what extreme it collects everything, but... And you as a lead investigator, of course, you reviewed those iMessages, right? I re reviewed some and may not have been reviewed by, every, by myself or all of them. Do you remember on August 12, 2014... Objection, hearsay. Same response, Your Honor. Overruled. On August 12, 2014 through August 13, 2014, where Ms. Magbanwa sends a text message to Mr. Adelson saying, can you call me when you get a chance, have something to ask you about your site? I'm not saying today, any time of the week, because he's asking me and telling me to call your office to get some info and to set up a meeting, but I'm going to tell him to just meet you up anywhere you're at Response, I will call him first break today, today, repeated, to set something up. Can I text me his contact info? And that was read correctly. There was just a mistake. That was from McBanwa to Adels, Charlie Adelson? Correct. And that remember? was August 14, August of 2014? August 12th and August 13th. I don't recall that specifically, no. And you remember the, the government's exhibit is somewhere here, but the government's exhibit for the paychecks, right? Yes. Now, when did these paychecks start? Down at the bottom, the date right there. I can't read it from here, but I believe it's September of 2014. September 18, 2014, that's when the paychecks start, right? Correct. Now, staying on the topic of the iMessages, in your review, your objective review, do you remember the text message where Catherine McBanwa texts Charles Adelson on September 14, 2014, four days before that, text him, I'll let you know my availability so you can know more or less how many hours I can dedicate. Thank you again. Is that or is that not evidence that she's about to start working for him in receiving paychecks? That sounds like it is. Next, on September 17, 2014, Catherine McBanwa sends a text message to Charles Adelson. That's awesome! Exclamation point. Thank you so much. I'll call them to make sure they put me in the schedule. You said my full name. Charles Adelson to Catherine McBanwa, no problem. You're helping me out more than I'm helping you. I'm excited to start, excuse me, that, that's Catherine McBanwa. No problem, you're helping me out more than I'm helping you. I'm excited to start, yay. Next message, cool, it should work good. I did say you would call. I did not give your full name, but just say, but just call, it's cool. Response, KK. Now these messages are on September 17th, 2014, the day before she starts receiving patients. It's evidence that she's working there, right? Sounds like it. 
So the answer that was given to the state of no evidence that she's working there, that was incorrect, right? No, that was my answer to the state. In your These are text messages. I don't even know what preceded the first part of that. Awesome. What was what was the awesome in reference to? How do you how do you not know? You said you reviewed the i messages. I don't have them all right here in front of me. You're you're referring and picking up in midstream and saying awesome and starting off this whole diatribe. I don't know what the message was before that that all she's right. referring to. So do me a favor. Explain to this jury what could have preceded. I'll let you know my availability so you can know more or less how many hours I can dedicate. Thank you again. Objection calls for speculation. Argumentative. All right. He's already answered the question. Let's move on. In your review of the I messages, you also came across the messages on November 6, 2014, where Charles Adelson writes to Catherine McVanwa, put that you work in the office, not at home. Put, was that the first word you said? Yeah. Let me know if you, let me know if you need me to reread it. Put that you work in the office, not at home. Next message. No shit, Sherlock. My apologies, Judge. Response, LOL. Next, I don't know pay period dates. Can you call me? I'm driving. Focusing first, so you agree with me, November 2014 is right at the beginning of when she's working there, right? Yes. And there's a message that says, put that you work in the office, not at home, right? I heard you. That would indicate two things to you, right? That she is working for the Adelson Institute, right? He's telling her what to put on something. I have no idea what that's in reference to. But it's... But it says in there, put that you work in the office, not at home. That was a big deal for you on direct, the fact that you never saw her leave home and go to the Adelson Institute, right? Correct. All of this lines up with the fact of what you found out in your investigation, that what she was doing was communicating with patients and she was doing it remotely. Could have been easily explained at answering the subpoena, but it never was. Investigator, do me a favor. Look at this jury. Can you can you tell them con conclusively that she did not work for Charles Adelson, legitimately receiving that money? I can tell you that, that I could find no evidence of what duties, how she was employed, what schedule, or any way that would adjust for this compensation. Nothing. And as the I could not find anything, and it was subpoenaed to the office. You would think that an office could supply an application, a W-4, a schedule, duty. Nothing was provided, only, excuse me, only that these paychecks were paid to her on those days. Investigator, my question was, can you conclusively say to them, no, she didn't work there? No. Because there's evidence that indicates that she did, right? You've read it out. I've stated my answer. Let me give you a name, and this is, we're talking about your investigation. Juan Marcos Vega. Are you aware of who that is? I, I barely remember the name. That he was a Latin king? I don't even recall whether he was a Latin king. Did you ever take a look at Luis Rivera's federal indictment? I'm sure I did. I, I don't, at this point, I don't recall what exactly it said. Do you recall that he was a co-defendant in Luis Rivera's federal indictment? Objection, relevance. Would it refresh your recollection to take a look at the indictment? All right, the objection's overruled, and you can go ahead and show it to him. Sure.
Okay. Make sure you show that to the state. I don't recall reading this before. I mean, I can sit here and read the whole thing, but I, I don't recall reading this before. This is a federal indictment. Okay. Fair enough. If you don't remember, we can just take a look at it. Did, now Jason Newland, he's an investigator for Ms. Kaplan in the state attorney's office, correct? Yes. Works with the prosecution. Yes. When you were working the case and still the lead investigator, did you ever receive information from him concerning the name Juan Marcos Vega? I did receive a couple of different names from him, and that may have been one of them. Was any investigation done into Juan Marcos Vega? I did not. I don't know if uh, Investigator Newland did, but unless I documented it and have forgotten about it, then it was not my play. Yeah, we're just talking about you. I, I did not. Let's go back to Luis Rivera and specifically the, the statements that he made to you. On October 4th, 2016, you and Agent Patrick Sanford from the FBI, you sit down with him and you have a recorded interview, right? October 4th, 2016, correct. And that was at Jefferson County? Jefferson County Jail. Now, a couple days before that, September 30th, 2016, you have your first meeting with him. Yes. Now, for the jury, <coughs> these two meetings, these aren't investigative meetings, right? These are proffers. They're referred to as a proffer by a defendant. This is where he's showcasing what information he can give you to get a deal. I just take the information as part of the investigation. I have nothing to do with the deal, but yes. Yeah, you, you get the information, you then pass it over to the government, but it's ultimately the, 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 the currency that he has to get a deal, right? That's what he, yes, that's the way I understand it works, yes. The first meeting with him on September 30th, 2016, it was not recorded, right? No. But could have been. Yes. You were notified, as you told us before, the day before, on September 29, 2016, right? September 29, I was notified that the next day they requested me, uh, myself and uh, Agent Sanford, to interview him at the Jefferson County Jail, which would be September 30th. So you'd agree with me that you had time to prepare? Time to prepare? A recording device. There's already a recording device at the Jefferson County Jail. And I yet, was told, I was informed of that. And yet it still wasn't recorded. It was not recorded. And that was a decision to not record it. Because the capabilities were right there. You were in an interview room. Correct. In fact, you were in the same room that days later you did the recorded interview, right? Correct. You also had cameras of your own. Uh, back up in that cameras of my own. Let me help you out. Right after that meeting, you get into a van and go looking for the gun, right? Right. I was supplied a body cam that uniformed officers primarily wear. Um, I was supplied that right before we went on a van ride on September 30th, 2016, to retrace the steps, the route they took that day. You would agree with me as law enforcement. You don't need approval to record. You can do it surreptitiously. Right. Yes. You'd agree with me that the September 30th, 2016 interview or proffer should have been recorded, right? You'd agree with me on that? 
not necessarily as a decision by the state attorney's office not to record it. We didn't record it. And all we have is your account of it. I did a detailed report on what was what was said during that meeting. It's not verbatim, it's not a recording, but it's my record. It's summarized, right? Yes. And those were, that word is specifically used in your report that this is summarized. Correct. So it's more of your opinion of what he's saying. No, it's not an opinion. It's, the, it's what, it's, it's not all regurgitated in detail. You would agree with me that you're not writing down quotes. Like the court reporter here is taking down exactly what I'm saying, right? Correct. That's not what's in your report. Correct. Your report is, Rivera said this, Rivera said that. Correct. Not a quote, open quote, this is what he said, close quote. It's you saying what, what you think he's saying. Correct. Let's go to another name, Anthony Ortiz. You know who that is, right? I, I know the name. It's, uh, it's been a while. I, I don't recall his involvement of anything. Anthony Ortiz, I do remember the name. And he goes by the nickname of Hebrew. Okay. And you know that he was a Latin king, correct? Yes. Now, you're saying that you're not sure of, a, of any involvement. On direct examination, the government moved in through you, Luis Rivera's call detail records, and you reviewed those when you were on the case, yes. right? Yes. The morning of July 19th, there was a bunch of communications with Luis Rivera and Anthony Ortiz, King Anthony, right? We weren't monitoring Luis Rivera's calls. I'm, is that what you're at referring to? Let me rephrase it. July 19th, 2014, the day after the murder. Right. When Luis Rivera tells this story that Catherine McBanwa is there for the payment of money. You remember that, right? Yes. You have Luis Rivera's call detail records from that morning, right? Okay. And there's a whole bunch of communications amongst all the other people where he's communicating with King Anthony, right? I have to take your word for it. I don't recall it specifically. But Thank I know you. that King Anthony or Hibaro does get involved as, as far as going to pick up someone. You never interviewed King Anthony, right? I don't recall interviewing King Anthony, no. You think that you would have written a report if you interviewed King Anthony, right? Yes. And Luis Rivera never made any mention of you about a third trip to Tallahassee, right? I've never heard of a third trip, only two. In all his statements to you, and in total, how many statements were there? 527, 2016, 6-3, 2016, 9-30, 30th, 2016, 10-4, 2016, right? Yeah. No mention of a third trip, right? No. Your reports only talked about two trips, though, right? Correct. Let's talk about the gun. You don't have the murder weapon in this case. Do not. You know the route that was taken by Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera after the murder, right? Correct. I-75? Well, from here, I-10, but yes, to 75. Now, you know this because the cell phone communications track the route that they take. Correct. Ultimately, the, the search for the murder weapon has stopped. Yes. There was a few attempts that were made in 2016. Yes. And that's it, correct? I don't know if there's been anything since I retired. In your time on it, it was limited to the end of September, the beginning of October 2016. The end of September through October, you said? Correct. That sounds about right. I, I don't recall exactly when the, the last attempt was. It may have been as late as early November. But ultimately, you made a few attempts to try to find We it. desperately were looking for where the gun had been discarded. Now, the reason why you're out there looking for it is because Luis Rivera is supposedly trying to help you find it, right? Yeah. He's, he, he tells you uh, Sigfredo Garcia you know, threw it near a bridge. Right. But ultimately, he was never able to give you the exact location. No, he was not. Your Honor, Dr. Brooks? Nay. I'm showing you a remark in defense six. 
You know what that I've is. seen it, yes. That's the, well, I got, I got a Ladies Foundation question. I'm with you. You I'm know with what that is? <laughs> yes. All right, that's the drawing that Louis Rivera did for you to help you locate the, the murder weapon, right? Yes. All right. And you know what that is because you were in the room when he handed it over to you and Agent Santa. I believe, yes, on October 4th, I believe. And it's in the same or substantially the same condition it was in when you received it on October 4th. It does appear. Defense offers into evidence with the remark of Defense 6. No objection. All right, it'll be admitted as Defense Exhibit 6. He offered it. It was not even solicited. He just, when he came in for the the interview, um, at some point he produced it, and, and uh, with his limited education, that's what he got. And Dangerous he, guy, right? Yeah. Career criminal. Yes, my Pot understanding, yes. Potentially with a motive of not wanting you to find that gun, right? <laughs> I... I truly believe he thought it would help somehow for his credibility. If he could find the gun, it would. He believed it would help his credibility. He thought this would help his credibility. He thought finding the gun would help his credibility. I can't help his artistic talent. But that's what, he, that's what he drove. He, he explained. He was very consistent in explaining. You cross over this bridge, and you pull over on the side of the road right next to this guardrail. Well. There's only about 10 dozen of those things along I-75 if you go south. Or perhaps he just wanted to present himself as appearing helpful so that he could get a deal. I think the, I think the deal was already done at that point. October 4, 2016? October 4, 2016. Took the plea the next day, right? I don't know. I mean, he, but these trips were after that. These trips were all later than that. The trips down to South Florida to try to locate the gun were after he'd already entered his plea to my understanding. Investigator, I understand you've been retired for years and it's years out. Correct me if I'm wrong. You speak with him on September 30th, 2016. You get into a van that day and you're going to look for the gun, right? No, that's incorrect. You disagree that you went to look for the gun on September 30th, 2016? I do disagree with that. Okay. Let's go back to Ms. Magbano and her arrest. You were present with Agent Sanford in South Florida when Ms. Magbano was arrested. Yes. And she's arrested the day after Luis Rivera names her. Yes. It's 10 to 15 law enforcement that surround Ms. Magbano. Yes. Guns are drawn. There are some guns drawn. She didn't flee. She did not flee. She was so scared by the police presence and the firepower that she urinated herself. Apparently. Apparently? You saw it, right? You were there. I, I was told. I did not witness that actual action, but I was told she had. The reason why you and Agent Sanford were there, you didn't have to be there for the arrest, right? Uh, we wanted the opportunity in case her counsel decided to allow her to speak to us. We wanted to be there. You were hoping that she would cooperate? Of course to further advance this theory that you believed was correct. Objection, argumentative. Overruled. You can answer. Sure. To further advance the theory. Sure. Okay. And it was your words that if she had cooperated, no charges, nothing, you can walk out of jail once we get all this testimony from you. Hold on. Objection. And that's a, your, what's the question? That he made that statement? Yes, Your Honor. All right. You can answer whether or not you made that statement. I'd like to have it repeated now. All right, you can repeat that. Would it help you to read your deposition? Do you want that or do you want me to read I just, it? Just the question is fine. I just, I, there was a lot going on here. In your words specifically, in your intent, in your motive at that point specifically was no charges, nothing. You can walk out of jail once we get all this testimony from you. That's what I reportedly said? Yes. No, totally incorrect. Brief 
moment, Your Honor. Briefly. Objection, may we approach? Okay.
Investigator. The, you said a moment ago the hope was talking to Ms. Van Den with attorneys and hope to get cooperation, right? Yes. And you had talked about on direct examination about some phone calls, right? That you allowed Ms. McBanwa to call Ms. Kowas. Yes. And how about 10 minutes later you get a phone call from Mr. Adelson's attorney at the time? Yes. And your belief is that that somehow establishes a connection in between Ms. McBanwa and Mr. Adelson, right? Objection, relevance. Overruled. If you know, if you can I, answer. I thought that uh, it was quite significant that another co-defendant or unindicted co-defendant's attorney had already learned about Ms. McBanwa's arrest, arrest so quickly. There was no press release. It was within minutes. Let's jump into this. So Ms. McBan was arrested. Yes. You contact Ms. Kowas and the, the hope is for cooperation at that point in time. Actually, it was just the, the phone was held up so Ms. McBanwa could talk to the <coughs> counsel. You didn't take the phone away and have a specific conversation with Ms. Kowas? where she asked you for a copy of the arrest warrant to even know why Ms. McBanwell was arrested? I don't recall that. I think we had a separate phone call from my own phone. All right. Now, are you aware of who else Ms. McBanwell called? Now, are you aware that she called Sigfredo Garcia's attorney, Sam Zengane, to find out if he knew anything about what was going on? Objection. Calls for speculation. Overruled, if you know. I've heard of it. I've heard that that she did call more than one attorney, yes. Do you know, do you know whether Mr. Zengane called Mr. Marcus? Objection, speculation. If do you know? I have no, I don't know. Now, the purpose of the communications, there'd be nothing wrong with attorneys communicating with another to say, hey, has your client been charged as well too? I don't have a copy of an arrest warrant. We want to know what's going on. Anything wrong in that? At face value, it doesn't sound like it. Sounds like it's pretty quick, though. Isn't it just looking at everybody and anything through dirty windows instead of clean windows? Objection. Argumentative. That's argumentative. You don't have to answer that. The next question. You don't deny that Ms. Kowas was trying to get a copy of the arrest warrant from you to know the basis for the arrest, right? You don't deny that. No, I, I just, I didn't have a copy with me. I didn't have a copy on me to provide. She was not on scene. Ms. Kowas was at another location, and I told her where um, Catherine McBanwin would be transported, which was the Broward Main Jail, it's called, and that's where she could meet her client. And if she had, after meeting her client, if she decided to provide us any information, she knew my phone number. You got a one brief moment? Yes. Investigator, last topic here. We're going to turn the attention back onto Ms. Van Banwa, specifically with evidence of innocence. There are hundreds of phone calls in this case, correct? Yes. You've reviewed those. <laughs> I can't swear that I've reviewed all of them, but I've reviewed a good portion. You trust that they've been reviewed by yes. law enforcement, though, right? Yes, to my knowledge, yes. You would agree that in those in those secretive recordings of literally hundreds of phone calls of Ms. McBanwa, there is not one admission of involvement or reference of involvement in this case. Correct. There is evidence, though, that she was working at the Adelson Institute, though, right? From what you what you provided beforehand. Now, there's also text messages, hundreds thousands of text messages, right? Yes. Those have been reviewed by law enforcement, right? I, I did not review them, no. 
but someone may else may have. I'm sure they did. Nothing incriminating against Ms. Magbano. I have no idea. I can't attest to that. Sigfredo Garcia and Luis Rivera are arrested in May, June 2016, and there's a lot of media about it, right? Yes. She didn't flee, right? She didn't flee. Continued living her normal life, right? To my knowledge. There was probable cause affidavits. Now, for the jury, again, a probable cause affidavit that's attached to the arrest warrant, right? Yes. That's that narrative, that long explanation of what's going on. There was an earlier version of an arrest warrant that was leaked to the media months before Ms. McBann was arrested, correct? I remember, I remember something to that effect, but I don't, th I don't think that was McBanwa's arrest warrant. That it was both Charles Adelson and Ms. McBanwa that there was arrest warrants that were leaked. I just recall the one for Charlie Adelson. I didn't remember that there was one. I don't recall there was one specifically for McBanwa. There could have been. I don't know how they were leaked. Okay, so l let's stay on, on your topic of that one was leaked for Charles Adelson to the media, right? <laughs> I just know I remember seeing it, Yeah, but that's the only knowledge of I, that I have. And within that arrest warrant, that PC affidavit to the arrest warrant, it talked about the theory that Ms. McBanwa was involved, right? I don't know if that was in there or not. I don't know if that part of my report or any documentation that I did was in that document. But those narrative sections are pretty thorough, right? I'm sorry, the narrative sections? Of, the, of, an, of a warrant to get a warrant because you have to establish enough to be able to make an arrest, right? They, they don't necessarily are not, you know, everything in the case, if that's what you're saying. Okay, but what we're getting at here is that that's leaked to the media and it's out there for Ms. McBanwa to see, right? Okay. She doesn't flee. She, she never fled. There was a, a, a special on 2020. You saw that, right? Yes. A 2020 special, national television, naming her is involved in this case, right? Yes, she was named. She went about her normal day. It's evidence of innocence, right? <laughs> I don't think you want me to comment on that. It's either way. Nothing further, Your Honor. Thank you. Redirect. Are you familiar with the attempts to interview Catherine Magbanoa? Yes. And simultaneously, Sigfredo Garcia, her husband, the shooter? Yes. All right. And that was done on what date? Uh, the 20, I think it was May 24th, if I remember right. Okay. Of what year? For, I'm sorry, of 2016. Okay, and were you part of those yes. interview attempts? Yes. What was your role in the interview attempts? M myself and a task force officer from South Florida went to the residence at the time for Miss Magbanwa. Uh, we knew she was home, and we went there. In Objection, the Your Honor, beyond the scope of direct and oh. cross-examination. Overruled. Uh, permission for recross on this no. topic? No, not at this point. She was home. We went, we went to that location in an attempt to interview her, <clears throat> to talk to her about her involvement and get as much information from her as possible before arresting her. She, we had no intention of arresting her. She would not come to the door. She actually was on a phone call with a co-worker of the Sigfredo Garcia um, and said she knew. Objection, we hearsay, move to strike. That's sustained. All right, so she didn't come to the door. No. How long were you out there? 15 minutes. Knocking on the door? Knocking on the door, standing out front, showing ourselves visibly. Um, okay. And what did she do after that? She she called back, or she got, tried to get a hold of Rivera, I'm sorry, Garcia, um, and eventually they did talk to, to each other, I don't recall, 
what happened after that specifically that same day? Yeah, she packed up her stuff. Didn't well, she? okay, yes. Eventually, later that day, she did pack up her stuff. And she left that she residence. Did. Yes. She fled that residence. Yes. Objection, Your Honor. Mischaracter mischaracterization of the evidence. If we can please go sidebar. No, I don't need to at this point. That's overruled. You can continue. She didn't stay at that residence again, did no, she? No, she did not. And she dumped her cell phone that day, didn't she? Yes. And went and bought a burner phone, didn't she? They met at Walmart, yes. her and Sigfredo. Her and Sigfredo both got burner phones that day, didn't they? Yes. You don't make deals with criminal defendants, do you? No, I have no authority to do that. Do you negotiate how many years somebody's going to get? Nothing like that. Do you control what it is that a witness is going to give as a statement? No, nothing. Do you suggest certain things would be good to give as a statement? I can't. I have no authority, and I, and I wouldn't do that. Right. And you didn't do that with Lewis Rivera, no. did you? Did you ever hear a statement come out of Lewis Rivera's mouth? Were you ever present? Or a statement from Luis Rivera that did not include this defendant, Catherine McBanawa, hiring him and Sigredo Garcia to come up here and kill Dan Markell. No, it was consistently, his statement was always included, Catherine McBanawa. When you went to Coleman Prison to talk to him initially, he wasn't under arrest. No. He didn't have anything to plead to. Objection, Your Honor. We're getting into leading questions. That is leading questions. Please rephrase your questions, Ms. Kaplan. Did he have anything to plead to? No. He wasn't charged with anything. He was not at that time. Wasn't it Luis Rivera that told law enforcement for the first time that the money drop occurred the morning after the murder? Yes. Because we thought maybe it was the night before. We really didn't know, right? That's correct. And after Luis Rivera told law enforcement that the money drop happened the morning after the murder, that's when Chris Corbett looked at the phones and found all the evidence objection, to corroborate leading. that statement. Oh, What's your objection? Leading and it beyond the personal knowledge of this witness. She's talking about what another witness knows. It's not leading. Overruled. You can answer the question. That's how it occurred, correct. That, that, um, it provided, um, he, what he provided was a basis to look at where each individual phone was, each of the phones were that day. At a certain time? Yes. And that wasn't something he read in a report? No. In fact, he didn't read anything in a report, did he? I objection, Your Honor. Again, leading questions. That's a leading question. Rephrase did Luis Rivera read anything? I don't think he's capable of reading. Not very well. No, I, my, I don't know what education level he's at, but um, I know that he's limited. He's limited on what he can read. All right. Then defense asked you about the evidence that their client was contacting patients, and was the evidence that you were shown on cross examination by the defense any evidence of her? I mean, was she contacting a patient in what they showed you? It didn't show that. All right, so she's talking about contacting a patient. Yes. All right, and you're familiar with the wiretap in this case. Yes. Maybe not every single call verbatim, but in general, you get the idea of the wiretap. Right. You've heard a lot of those calls. Yes. Okay. And are the parties speaking in code on those calls? The, the, Objection, Your okay. Honor. In, in move to strike in proper opinion. That's a pro I, I'm going to agree with that. That's sustained. And uh, so uh, the jury's to disregard that. Ask another question. Are the parties on those calls specifically referencing contacting patients in a way that does not suggest they're really contacting patients? Hold on. Your Honor, objection, and for the record, counsel has just done air quotes to indicate that somehow it was coding. This is a violation of the motions and lemonade. Right. Please go sidebar. All right. No, that's overruled. I'll allow the question. Please repeat it. And ask the question Are again. people talking about contacting patients on this wire? in such a way that does not appear there are any contacts being made with patients. Yes. Objection, improper opinion, move to strike. Overruled. Yes, it appears that it's staged language. Thank you. And you don't anywhere on the wire have any calls where Catherine McBanawa actually called any patients? No. 
Are you familiar with Catherine McVanna's prior testimony in this case on October 9th, 2019? Objection, Your Honor. And your no. objection, hold on. What's your objection? We can go sidebar on this one. We'll go sidebar on this one. He's under a subpoena, we'll just call it. She's going to call the minister private. All right, so I wanted to ask you about some of these iCloud text messages that you were asked about on cross-examination. Okay. Okay, one of them had to do with, just a moment. Getting on the schedule, you recall that one, being asked about that? Something about a schedule, yes. Okay, and that was offered to you as evidence that Ms. McVanna worked at the Adelson Institute. Recall yes. That? That Would was... it refresh your recollection to see the entire text thread in context? Sure. I'm going to approach. Counsel.
That's what they're trying to say. They're trying to say it was about. Okay. Okay, so does that refresh your recollection? <laughs> I don't re yes. You reviewed the context of that yes. put me on the schedule comment now. Yes. And what does it appear based on your review of the context that they were talking about in reference to putting her on the schedule? Objection. Relevance and proper opinion. Overruled. It's uh, this Mag Magbonwa is scheduling to get a wisdom tooth removed. By whom? By Charlie Abelson. Okay, look at it again because I maybe it's not clear. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to start. I can hear you from here, so. All right. All right, so she's communicating with Charlie Abelson. Yes. Making a right to get a wisdom to pull. Yes. All right, and that is his line of work. That is his line of work, yes.
Yeah, no, if we can go sidebar, please. It's about the website, yes. All right. You were asked about on cross about her making a phone call for him in August of 2014, and you're specifically asked about a message involving uh, something about a site. You remember that? Yes. All right. That was in. That was August 12th of 2014. I'm showing you what the Internet Covenants of State 68 are. Those the paychecks. Yes. When did she begin receiving? September 18th, 2014. Okay, so not during the time of the message you were shown. Right. Lastly, you were asked about uh, a message involving Charlie Adelson instructing Ms. McBanala to say she worked at the office rather than, or to put that she worked at the office rather than at home? Yes. Okay. And in that message, did you have an opportunity to review that no. message? No. Okay. Okay. So what is Charlie Adelson advising her to do in those? It, it's hard for me to see. It appears that he's saying 
put that you work in the office, not at home. She responds. No shit. Yeah, well, well, we already went over that. No shit, Sherlock. LOL. All right, and, and I can't we don't know the context as far as what form or document or to whom she's representing she works at the office, right. do we, based no. on that exhibit? Right. Okay. Um, and it appears, it suggests that she's to misrepresent where she's working, doesn't it? That's what it sounds like because it says, I don't know pay period dates. Objection, leaving, counsel testifying. Uh, would you let's add put in the form of a question there. would you expect someone to know the pay period dates if they were employed yes so based on this further review of those text messages as you sit here today do yes. you have any evidence that Catherine Magdanawa was in fact employed at the Adelson Institute no she she was getting a paycheck from there yes okay. nothing further all right that concludes our testimony for uh, today and uh, so I'm going to uh, excuse you for the day. I'm going to ask uh, that you uh, come back tomorrow again at 830. We'll start promptly after everyone has arrived. And uh, I'm going to, again, uh, remind you, uh, don't watch any news reports. Don't look at anything on the Internet. Don't have any conversations with any friends or family members or with each other. And we'll see everybody here tomorrow morning at 830. And we'll start soon after that. Okay? Have a good evening. Thank you. You can just leave your pads on your chairs, and uh, we'll take care of those. All right, Mr. Isom, you may step down. <laughs> Sorry about that. All right, the jury is out of the courtroom, the door is closed, and uh, that concludes the testimony <coughs> for today. Um, just a few things uh, bef uh, before we break. Uh, tomorrow morning, um, we're going to hear <coughs> um, from Wendy Adelson's attorney. We'll hear that uh, first off, and um, uh, whatever he wants to put on the record, I've given him permission to do that. I think you already have my ruling in regards to Ms. Adelson's testimony. So uh, we anticipate uh, that she'll be testifying, Ms. Kappelman, tomorrow morning? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, all right. So uh, my previous ruling is that uh, the cross-examination will be limited by whatever uh, the direct examination is and also um, any future calling of Ms. Adelson for purposes of testifying under a defense subpoena uh, if we know now what we anticipate we're going to hear from his her attorney that she's just going to take the fifth that she will not be called to testify uh, under those pretenses um, also uh, just for planning purposes and security purposes will we have uh, do you anticipate that Mr. Rivera will be testifying tomorrow, Ms. Kaplan? Yes, Your Honor. We do hope to get to Mr. Rivera tomorrow afternoon. Okay, tomorrow afternoon. All right. And so uh, that was one thing that, um, Mr. DeCoste, that you had requested in regards to particular witnesses to know if they are going to testify uh, so that you can be prepared with whatever items you need to bring for court so you do know that. Uh, those two particular witnesses, uh, we anticipate they'll testify tomorrow, okay? All right, so uh, we'll break for the evening. The jury's coming at 8.30. Um, let's be ready to go uh, here in the courtroom at 8.45, and then uh, we'll start either at that time. We'll hear from uh, Wendy Adelson's attorney first, and then we'll start with the testimony back up. Okay, everyone have a good evening. Thank, Thank you. you. We'll be Your Honor, one brief matter. Yes. Investigator Isom, um, we would like him to remain under the government subpoena. He is also under ours and most likely will be called in our case of you. All right. So, Mr. Isom, you are still under subpoena. You need to be uh, communicate with the state uh, in anticipation of potentially being recalled, and they'll uh, let you know uh, either side will be in contact with you in regards to that, okay? Yes. 
All right, thank you. Your Honor, in the final order from the court that the rule has been invoked and we do not watch any of the testimony of other witnesses. Okay, Mr. Isom, you know that. No discussions with any other witnesses. You can talk with the attorneys, but no reading of anything else in regards to the trial until your testimony is concluded, okay? Yes, sir. All right, thank you, sir. Okay. Now, Mr. Dukos, is it okay if we break for the evening? We're in recess. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you. Thank you.